Hi, everybody. Welcome to WonderCon 2021. This is the writer's panel for Image Comics. Uh, my name is Marla Isaac. I'm the talent liaison at Image Comics, and we have a bunch of very talented writers here to talk to us today just a bit about storytelling, technique, the comic industry, whatever they feel like. Um, we have some really great writers here. So I'm just going to introduce everybody really quick. Uh, First up, we have Pornsack Puchichote. He is the co-creator and writer on the upcoming miniseries, The Good Asian, as well as Infidel uh, Image. Yay. Uh, we have Scott Snyder. He's the co-creator and writer on uh, the upcoming, well, the already released series, Noctera, as well as Undiscovered Country. Uh, Rodney Barnes is known for his work on Marvel's Runways and American Gods. And then we he's also the co-creator and writer on Philadelphia, a very scary book. Uh, Kieran Gillen is the co-creator and writer for our series Die with Stephanie Hans. And you two just won the award for the British Fantasy Award, correct? Yeah, yeah, British Fantasy Die. Award won best yeah. comic or graphic novel, which is really nice. Yeah. Like, you know, ah, congratulations, yeah. Thank that's you. huge. Mm. Yay. Yes. So we're all here. We're doing the virtual panel. We were talking a little bit about how like it's, it's very different from being live at the cons, but I don't know. I like it. We get to be at home. We get to be with our cats. It's just very different. Yeah. I know that like we did a couple of these panels, the virtual panels for San Diego and you know, it's good. It works. I'm glad we live in a time where we get to like have this technology, but I do miss seeing people in person. It is nice to see what everyone's offices look like though. I, I get a yeah. big kick out of that. I always well, imagine that like outside of this frame is like just a just <laughs> chaos. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. like a Hollywood backdrop. Yeah. I have like a stack of books over here. That's very scary. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, mine is basically here. <laughs> That's and it's great. everyone is Jared, watching. Oh my stream. god! Yeah, everyone just watches my stream, expecting the thing to collapse because they're not pinned <laughs> to the wall. You know, they are li I'm literally in danger at all. We're time. honestly going to see your death. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. this is this is what you get from Image. You get real, real exclusive creator access. <laughs> yeah, there, there you go. We make really good hardcovers that are excellent for murder. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'll just jump right into it. Uh. So I'm curious, as kind of a general question, uh, why comics? Why write comics? Rodney, you like you've worked in television, obviously. Porn tech, you're an editor. Scott, you taught writing. Um, what is it about comics that's kind of brought you back to it every time? And also creator-owned comics specifically. Uh, I've always loved them. I mean, uh, they were the first love of that I can recall, like as a kid, I went to the library with my mother. She was a school teacher and uh, I always knew where the comic books were. Mm -hmm. And whatever emotional connection that I made early on just sort of endured. And, you know, there's something about television and film. After you get into it for a while, it loses its romance. I haven't mm -hmm. really lost it with comics and still pure. And so, you know, it, it was funny thing it was easier getting into tv and film than it was to get into comics and now that i'm here you know it's everything that i hope that it would be so it's more idealism than anything mm -hmm. else yeah yeah i can see that. i mean i definitely can I, I definitely agree with that i mean i start off as a comic book editor i've been lucky enough to do other things now but i've always sort of seen i've always seen myself as an unprolific comic book editor a comic book writer because i comics to me are just it's the girl that brought me to the dance and it's like everything i love i see comics really and especially the stuff they're doing an image the stuff that scott and kieran and rodney you, all you guys are it's really i really do think it's at the forefront of culture i think there's a reason you know we, we're testing out all these ideas that other places don't have the guts that guts to do and image is like a great place where people are really getting a chance to sort of do that. I couldn't do my book, The Good Asian, anywhere else but Image. 
And, and also on like, just on a personal level, I love the people that come to comics, you know? I mean, there's just, I just think they're just lovely. Pe they're lovely people. They're, I've had so much generosity from artists to the point where my, my business team editor brain goes like, don't do that. That is, that is a horrible business decision. Don't volunteer to do a cover like that for free, no. Mm -hmm. But like, it's just the most, the loveliest people come to comics. And I also think too, you know, especially from like the, the aspect of comics that we all come from, it's a weird thing where like, you know, I, I mean, I've, I've hung out with, 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 with you guys and I talked to you guys, but even if I hadn't, like, we all have so much in common in terms of our interests. And it's, it's this fascinating thing of like at a certain generation of comic books fans, we all kind of like the same things, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, and there's a lot of like, you know, variation upon that, but it's just, it's a great sense of community. I mean, you can see that like comics, I think is the only business that's actually gotten better during the quarantine, you know, like, and that's just because of the passion of the people who, who read them and, and put them out. So I just, mm. I'm, I constantly feel lucky to just, you know, be able to be in this world and talk to the people like you guys that I talk to. Go on, you want to go? Go ahead. You you want to go, Kieran? Okay, okay. I must admit, like, I, uh, after Paul's like been so upbeat, this is Friday afternoon, late. I'm about <laughs> to stop work. So if you ask me why comics, my main answer is why <laughs> comics. Good question. Uh, That's I'm a great comics. question. <laughs> Honestly, like I I read comics as a kid, then dropped out as a teenager, and I came back hard as an adult. And I'm like, I was raised Catholic, and it's one of the things that like people who are late converts always are more seem to be more f weirdly fanatical. And I feel mm. very much like I got into comics at late twenties, and I, I felt like like a, like a convert and immediately like within like six months I was I went to my first con I wrote my first script when I came back and then it was like this medium fascinates me mm. and that was always the kind of thing is um I'm somebody who's quite uh, attracted to quote unquote new stuff like I mean I like novels and films and all that stuff but mediums are just still in the process of discovering everything in it like I used to be a games writer I mean, writing about games and that that medium is like you know we're still mm. working at how to build a building you know that everything, everything by definition is new and comics is the same way, like, there's a lot of stuff that's still to do there. And at the same time, also, there's so much power there. Like, we get to get form a small band and do a small, you know, like, I couldn't go and do a movie to compete with, like, the latest big Warner Bros movie. But I could do I could do one to compete with a, a JLA. I could just, you know, if I kidnap Frank quietly and put him in a, you know, a hole for, like, um, <laughs> a few months, I could do a comic to compete with anybody. So it's so much about the pounds, and you can put the band together and put your vision on the paper, like the vision of a group of people. You know what I mean? It's very democratic in that way. Um, and, of course, everything everyone else says as well. Like, you know, the people are great. And, like, you know, no one gets into the comic because of the money. You know, <laughs> it's like you're getting because you love it. And you, you think there's something magical on that paper. And um, especially with Image, like, Image is the place where you get to, do your idea in its purest state. Like, I'm, I'm always aware that the stuff I, you know, I would pitch elsewhere and I would never pitch an image because it's like mm. with image, I want to push it far as far into the red as it's possible to do the medium. Anyway, love it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I think that the two things are that comics, for me too, like comics were the first love. Um, I always wanted to do it. I got into prose because. I wanted to be a comic book artist first and then mm. I wasn't I just realized when I was in college I wasn't good enough but the page behind me this page is like Todd McFarlane Spider-Man page so when I was oh, like yeah. 13 that my whole birthday I was like all I want to do is go to New York Comic Con and eat Todd McFarlane and that's it and I went with my dad I had all my money saved up it was like 100 bucks mm. and I was like I'm gonna wait on this line for three hours and meet him and you know try and buy something and uh, I when I finally got up to him he was so nice. He was like, uh, it's your birthday, you're 13. Let me give you a page that I think you deserve or whatever. And he gave me that page, which wow. is Spider-Man. Oh, I was like, wow. You That's know. Huge. And he drew me a Spider-Man on the back. It says, happy birthday, Scott. I'll never sell it. It's like, but the, the, whole, the whole sort of idea of comics for me sort of centers on that kind of um, like inclusion, that idea of somebody saying to you, come be a part of this. And mm -hmm. when I wound up being in prose for a while, uh, you know, I enjoyed it. But what I realized after a while was that it's so lonely. And I think the thing about comics for me is the, is the collaborative aspect, like other people have touched on too, where you're making something together from the ground up. Mm -hmm. And you're relying on everyone to elevate, you know, each other's our artistry. So, you know, I'll write a script, give it to the art and the artist, comes back with something better than I could do. I adjust what I was doing dialogue wise. And it's this, you're making something organic and fluid and living like together. And there's a real joy and exuberance in that that you don't find in other medium. And I think 
going back to Rodney's point too, I mean, with pros, you know, there's the loneliness, there's the, there's the, there's the, the long sort of runway to make a book. With TV and film, also there's the a million levels of approval and, 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 you know, death by committee or life by committee that, you know, exists with it. With comics and especially with creator own comics above all, a place like Image, you're just making something with your friends and peers that you get to decide how it comes out, what it is, all of it, and just throw that thing into the world and make it as raw and as you as, as you want. And so there's, there's just a tremendous creative freedom with it that I don't see anywhere else, you know, with other medium. If you're interested in like collaborating and making something that exists as a shared, you know, um, as a shared like mixed DNA thing that you're putting out there with other people that you trust to make you better than you'd be alone. Mm. So that, that's, the, that's the fun of it, I think in some ways. And it is like, it's, I think that's why it's such lovely people too, is that there are people that want to collaborate, that want to get along. Yeah. Yeah. together and, and 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 be inspired by each other and you know raise their own bar and be challenged by other people you know I mean there's always other contingents and people that are like you know <laughs> no one's in it for the money but you know there are people in it for this or that or to write Superman or Spider-Man or whatever but I mean I think the core people that come in whether they write superheroes or indie stuff or are there to make something personal with other people and there's mm-hmm. a vulnerability in that there's a generosity in that that yeah, it hurts people. I think that that you know you want to be around as a creator. I mean, off Scott's point, like I don't have a lick of musical talent, but I have to imagine making comics to me. I have to imagine it's like what it's like being in a band. I mean, it at times perhaps a very socially awkward band, but still like mm-hmm. a band, and it has all that fun and all that energy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true, and 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 also that vulnerability of like trusting your fans too, like like coming up with a totally new series and putting it out there and just hoping that they love it. Um, yeah. That takes a lot of courage. And I guess kind of jumping off of that, I'm curious about each of your collaboration process with your artists, what that's like, how that changes from project to project and artist to artist. Do you plot out a whole arc or a whole series together? Or do you kind of say like, this is what I have um, show me what you got kind of thing. How does that, how does that work for each of you? Kieran, you can start if you want. Well, uh, it's, I think the thing about band, and this is why I always talk about bands as a metaphor specifically is all bands are about finding how you play together. Like if I'm with Jamie, um, Jamie never had any input into, sorry, the Wicked Divine, uh, Jamie and um, never had any, any input on the plot per se. Like I would go and write this big Bible, then come to him and then we'd work out about how to execute it. So with Jamie, it's all about how we're going to do this. Like I, I'd write to him and he would, between us, we'd work out how we're going to perform it, if you will. And then there was someone like Stephanie, who Stephanie like wants to talk about stuff and have ideas, but Stephanie also isn't necessarily going to be deep into the plotting. So mm. I'm more like going to, and then most of the improvisation there is about, I write these scripts and I'm, since we're kind of creating a whole world in Die, I write really a lot. And then I'm at the bottom, I write too long, didn't read. This is what we need. <laughs> and like the, the, the too much is like you may want to do this or this and there's a there's a bit in like issue to like not 10 of die well basically i suggest okay this scene could happen here or it could happen here or it could happen here and i basically have researched three entire locations from like the brontes and described what they could be like but you know pick i don't care mm. but, you know that kind of what do you want to draw and what do you want to make your own and then stephanie picks it and make because she's i mean the metaphor i always use of jamie is like jamie is like daft punk to choose someone we're, we're missing at the moment like he's he's a Mm. he's like a machine you know he's all about the, uh, the synchronization and the, and the very small moments while stephanie is like collaborating with the ocean and with an ocean like you're going to go where the ocean goes <laughs> you know like i'm very much like what stephanie does and i'm, I'm responding to her a lot more i'm doing a lot more writing after the the actual uh, the pages are drawn as well you know what i mean and they're just two kind of extremes of what i do but generally speaking i've never quite done the let's work out a story together thing mm. um i'm not saying that's impossible but like you know, it's just never been how it's turned out. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll speak to that for a minute uh, too. I mean, for me, like the most valuable lesson that I learned was from Greg Capullo. I mean, creatively as a as a comic book writer, uh, when we started on Batman, where you know I was only writing full script and I was just handing it to artists. And the artists that I had worked with so far, Raphael Albuquerque and Jock, and uh, 
really that was the, the format that they enjoyed the most. So I, I didn't know that, but I, I just sort of, you know, I assumed it because um, I was green. I was totally brand new. And then around when I started on Batman with Greg, Greg was just like, you know, I don't like to work this way. I want to work from an outline. And I was like, I don't know how to do that. And it was all my own, my own fear of kind of letting go a bit. And then uh, when I saw how great his art was, when we got, uh, you know, a few issues in, I was like, you know what, I'm going to loosen up. And uh, the issue that I did that on was this issue that he came up with this crazy idea to start turning the book around when Batman is lost in this maze. And Pornsack, you were actually like at DC helping edit with that stuff. But the, uh, mm -hmm. anyway, the, what I came away with was that, you know, exactly what, what um, Kieran was saying too, is that you have to adjust to every artist and talk to them. You're a collaborative team. And what you say, what I like to, to do, and I'm sure what everybody here does too, is like approach the artist and say, what is it that, how do you like to work? You know, do you like full script? Do you like outline? Do you want to talk on the phone? Do you want me to just uh, plot? And then you, you do sort of expressive design, whatever it is, just say. And then, you know, you, the, the fun of comics, and I think, you know, one of the great joys of it is the excitement of something new with each, with each collaborator that way, where you, you adapt your own writing style to what makes them feel not only comfortable, but inspired so that they, you bring out the best in them and they bring out the best in you and you're going new places together. Otherwise there's no point, you know, you just get stale writing a script, turning it in. There's no, there's no fun in that. So it's the, it's the excitement of like the uncharted territory with each new person. And the people that I think a lot of us like, it's fun because, you know, Kieran working with Jamie a bunch, all that stuff, like the people that you gravitate towards, I think a lot of the time are people that even if they have a set way of doing things, want to be challenged with new things as well and grow, you know, as creators together. So I don't know, it's, it's the, I think it's, again, like going back to the, the core DNA of why we're all attracted to comics in one way or another is because it's a, it's a risky art where you're, you're doing something with someone else who you're, you're vulnerable to and you're giving a bunch of yourself to them saying, do what you will with this and make it better than I could yourself. And then they elevate it and then you try and elevate with what they did with that. And so it's the excitement of that process constantly, you know, the back and forth and changing everything that you do for a new collaborator or even for one that you're familiar with to make both of you the most exciting people out there to yourselves. Mm. You know, otherwise, you know, again, nobody does it for the, I mean, nobody we I think we hang out with or whatever does it for the money or for the whatever the clout. Of con it's what more. About how much of it <laughs> I do it purely for the groupies. <laughs> hey, Alex. Hi, hey, Alex. Sorry I'm late. I had three WonderCon panels this week and they were all and oh. like all the other ones were at 2 p.m. So my brain's just like it's so a WonderCon. It's like, uh... <laughs> No, I'm sorry. Not sorry. I just Alex it, to camp be everybody. Yay. Hi, my name's Alex and I can't manage my schedule. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> That's totally fine. Um, we're just talking about the collaboration process with artists right now. Um, she was saying basically like your pro I, and also let me just boot like I just read Dracula. We're not supposed oh, to curse. So Dracula good. Mofo. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Before it's so good. And it's you're so good. Erica was uh, fascinating to see yeah. how much room you gave her to to do the yeah. story. Her art is incredible. But the thing is, I didn't. And like, you know, you're sitting there going like, oh, sometimes I just write outlines, sometimes I talk on the phone with people. That sends me into a wave of existential terror. I cannot do that. Every <laughs> artist for me, and you know, I work with very specific artists and like people sort of have to be on my vibe, like, or, or not. You know, like it's kind of self-selects which artists approach me because my scripts mm -hmm. are incredibly difficult and usually very long um, and they're graphic, almost always graphic novels. So um, I always write a complete script. It's always completely finished before the artist gets it. It's not like, oh, what's going to happen in the third chapter? It's like, no, here's all seven chapters in the epilogue. Um, and then I tell them to ignore whatever parts of it they want to. So they, the reason I do that is so they know exactly what I'm thinking. So also, I'm a character writer, so I'm really diving into a lot of character work. You know, it's not like, oh, well, here's four, you know, here's five pages of fight scene, fill it as you see fit. I'm like, here's five pages of fight scene. And here's also the emotional arc that's happening during that fight scene mm. without actually having any words because we don't monologue when we fight because that's dumb. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I've always had really good results because people know that they're going to be supported whatever they do. And I view the script as me merely a platform that like on bad days, and we all have them, like on bad days when you're just not feeling it, like you just get up and, and my script is there as a safety net. And it's got like panels and camera angles and everything to it. And like, you know, all the dialogue. 
it's finished. Um, and on good days, you can just be like, yeah, no, I'm not going to do that. Like, actually, we could do the sequence a better way. But it gives them something to launch off rather than have, having to wonder what, you know, what the emotional beat is here. And also, mm -hmm. like, I, my style is so different than the superhero style that comes out of, like, people who have spent a lot of time at Marvel and DC. Um, again, it's, it's much more Naoki Urasawa. So, like, I need to put the reaction shots in there because some artists just aren't used to drawing them they've never had the opportunity because those those books are always like you know here's the thing here's another thing here's nothing they hardly ever like sit back and be like here's the environment i've created in the characters and i'm just going to let you sit in them and enjoy them for a bit before i start throwing shit at you you know hmm. but i mean and, I, I, you know, so and then like, but then also like i'm i'm lettering the book so it's hmm. myself so it's very easy for me to engage in a to creative jazz band style discussion with the art team where we're passing it back and forth to each other. And I can, I mean, I, I'm going to re-dialogue it anyway on the page, so. Yeah, that, that was what we were saying totally, was that you, regardless of your format, whether you adjusted the way people work as artists or you, you have your style, it's giving them the room to kind of change it yeah. and do what they, mm. they think is going to, you know, inspire them to make it even better than, than it would be as it was written in the first place. Yeah, my definition of hell is, is is just like sending out lines only, like, or Marvel style, like that, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that will never happen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, to that point, like, I, I love doing a lettering pass so much to the point where I wonder, I worry sometimes it's procrastination. But part of that is that because you get to watch sort of like how the artist has interpreted it and kind of like, you know, in a way, rediscover the page and rediscover like, oh, maybe this page wasn't working exactly the way I thought, or the energy of this page is here as opposed to there. I mean, I have a different sort of, uh, I, my process, I guess, is, is somewhere between what Alex and Scott is sort of talking about, because at least for the good Asian and the first certain extent infidel, the books just take so much research. I need to get a good mm -hmm. distance ahead of, of my artist, because I'm, I'm, I, my terror is that an artist won't be able to pay rent because of me. And so because oh. of that, I am, trying to stay very, very far ahead. And so that, that I'm never the reason. So like for the, something like The Good Asian and Infidel was like this too, I had to write sort of the first script first. And that was kind of my calling card to the artist and be kind of like, are you interested? And mm -hmm. then from there, I try not to get too much, after that first script, I try not to get too far ahead because I really want them to be part of the process. I, I want to, not just be part of the process, I want to build it around them. And again, as part of that work that I love that I worry is procrastination, I love going through an artist's work and seeing like, oh, this is the stuff they do well. Like, you know, every artist has their strike zone. And so you're like, oh, this is their strike zone. Oh, but you know, if they lean really far, they can hit this too. They just don't lean. So what can I do to like throw it to them over there a little bit more? Because I know they can hit it. They just might not know they can hit it. And that to me, I love that about comics. I love- also writing, yes. around, writing around the weak points of artists yes. too. Yes, yes. And, and that's also that fascinating thing, right? That like, as writers will never talk about, but like all, every artist has a different thing that they can't hit. And so, mm. and that's a fascinating thing of like, all right, how do I write around that? And, but, but utilize the stuff they do sort of really, really well. Right. And, and then from there, I try as much as possible, you know, it's a, it's a dance of being far enough ahead that they don't have, that I never have to worry that if I have to do something else that they'll be, be lacking work. And, but, but then also, being not so far ahead so that they can really in be involved with everything. I mean, I, you know, I started off as a comic book editor and, and as a result, I will always be a comic book editor and I'm giving notes on everything and I'm sure that's an obnoxious process. So I try to invite my artists, especially, you know, Aaron was like this and Alex is like this on this book to kind of give me script notes and tell me what they think. Cause I really want them to be involved, especially, you know, on a book like the good Asian, you know, Alex is a, I think you have Alex on a different panel. He's got a fascinating story about like finding out he was adopted and finding out at age 34, he was Asian. Like it's, it's checked, mm. ask him about it. It's a fascinating story, but like, he's got so many, such interesting things to say about identity as well. Like I want to make sure I, I incorporate incorporate all that and that's you know it's mm. part of the scary thing but it's also the like I think as Scott was saying it's it's part of that fear you put on the page because you know as a writer you want to make sure all this information is conveyed but you know it won't be conveyed in the best way unless you give your artist full freedom to do what they want and yeah. it's you know it's the fear and the thrill of working on comics but the research books you also have to be doing a lot of their googling for them because like you don't want your yeah. artist in there like doing your research on like what does a car in 1936 yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Oh, that's true, huh? on Hamilton to get like we have yeah. like, I was having to get the specific bits of military kit that people would be using and sticking Google links into that for Ryan. So he wouldn't have to be sitting there like playing guesswork in Canada about what the US military uses for like, you know, what, sure. what, 
what the last version of, of, of body armor was in the army, for example. Um, so yeah, like I think it's really important if you're doing a research heavy book that you are not depending on your artist to do the Googling for you. You should be putting in links to as much as you possibly can. It will make your script super, super ugly. It doesn't matter. Um, because then even if the artist decides to go in a different style, at least he's got, he or she or they have an, have an idea of, you know, this is what I'm imagining. This is the sort of car. Feel free to use a different car. If you, you know. um, also, you know, for car stuff, um, if you can link to sketch up models of cars or vehicles that you're having in the script cool. is a tremendous resource for the artist because then they can just, mm. um, you know, 3D models makes it much, much, much easier for them. They're gonna Google one anyway, like almost That's everybody cool. can sketch yeah. it. But back to what Pornzak was saying, like I think in many ways the difference between a good comic and a great comic is a really solid lettering pass. Because mm. sometimes you don't need that dialogue. Sometimes you need more. Um, because you know a point didn't quite land. Sometimes you want to add um, sound effects, which are a really unsung tool in Western comics, um, to show something like somebody picking up a key. The little letters in an otherwise silent panel will lead your eye to look at the fact of the character picking up the key, and then you're sure that the reader is going to get that point. And the comics geek to me too loves the fact that mm -hmm. different artists can handle different amount of copy on their pages. And I just love that. Like mm. that, that I just, it's one thing that's just so comics. And I just, I just love that that's a thing and that you've got to gauge how much copy you put on the page depending on your artist. Just to say my one liner, sorry, like I'm involved in the answer this one yet, but very quickly, right. my one liner is all comics yeah. are dubbed. And that's the thing people yeah. don't get on the outside that, that, you know, we always get to reinvent the lettering afterwards. So all comics mm. essentially lives in this state of dubness. That's interesting. Uh, that's if interesting. you want to, you know, like, and I certainly know I've done comics uh, back in the day where we completely changed the story via the lettering. Uh, like mm. we've realized we want to do a completely different story. We're going to mm. add, we're going to mad lib some stuff up. So yeah, <laughs> anyway, sorry. I'm just enjoying listening to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. Uh, as far as, um, my process up until this point, you know, I've only done like three or four, se uh, this will be, I think the fifth series. The first four, I had very little interaction with artists at all. I would do a script, I'd work with the editors for the most part, send it off and then a book would show up one day, like very little communication at all. Wow. With, with Jason Sean Alexander, it actually is too much communication because he <laughs> lives a mile away. Oh, wow. And so um, before COVID, we would, uh, Jason likes whiskey. So <laughs> we would meet at a restaurant between our two homes and uh, I would write the script, send it to him. He would read it. Then we would meet for dinner and then he would ask me to read it to him again. <laughs> I don't understand why. If I took too long, he might get drunk. Like, uh, so I would do it very, very quickly. And then he would start to like give me his notes, his thoughts, his ideas, uh, which was incredibly helpful because he had done a lot more than I had done up until that point, as far as how to visually, um, how the words could complement the art uh, that much more so. And it's been invaluable uh, mm. to Philadelphia and every other book uh, going forward that we're doing together. And so just that collaborative process to what Scott was saying before, it makes it feel like um, it, it, it's like a gang. It's like fun. It's like it, it is a degree of idealism about it. I know I said that before, but it just feels so collaborative and feels so good that it's actually the, the, the most fun of any writing that I do in any other medium. Mm. That's mm. a really important point. I mean, like comics doesn't pay enough for it not to be fun. Mm. Yeah. Like if, if you're not like if if everyone on the team isn't having fun, like you're you're doing it wrong. Yeah. You know? If it's, it's a slog. Really yeah. And there's so many art forms that depend on so many like levels of approval, you know, at some point. Mm -hmm. This again, like it's you and your partners making something. Oh, sorry, it's my we have like the baby, but the uh, not the baby calling, but <laughs> <laughs> the talented baby. Yeah. <laughs> Only he could call and express himself. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, he has three words. He can say duck, dog, and ball. Not mama. <laughs> oh. so, yeah. um, <laughs> but anyway, um, the uh, yeah, no, I mean, I think at, at some level, like the it is like the the fun of it is just what Alex said. Like if you're not enjoying it, there are many many other like medium that you media that you can go do where it's not as fun to collaborate and you have a lot of approvals and that, but you'll make mm. better money. 
But yeah. the joy here, I think, is that you can make what you want, especially at a place like Image, when you're doing creator own stuff with people that you trust. And that's it, you know? So you respect is a really important part of it as well. Like you're, you're respecting your colleagues as professionals um, and you're respecting their input and their taste and their desires, mm -hmm. even if it's not what you pictured. Um, part of that comes across, and I mean, Pornsack was saying he always gives feedback on, on, on layouts and I always do too. Because like if you're going to fix it, fix it in layouts, um, where it takes the least amount of time to change, and you know that can be anything from, oh, you know, can I suggest we just zoom in on this panel, or or, or um, I scripted this wrong and <laughs> we need to fix it because like my idea was bad, um, which happens um, a lot. Um, uh, I think one of the important things is the way you approach your art team with feedback, um, which is always like lead with positive, like make sure you give two compliments for every note. Um, and um, because it, you know, it again, it makes them happy. It makes the process nice, and it mm. makes you know, makes makes them realize that you're recognizing the probably day of work that went into that page. Because you know, one thing I've been saying on every panel is like, there's a page of um, a comics card takes a day for most artists to draw, and that's not including colors, and that's not including letters. Mm. So you 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 pick up a 200 page graphic novel, and that's 200 working days of, of, of the penciler and inker's life, mm -hmm. you know? So there's a lot of slow manual labor that goes into an experienced work that goes into drawing a comics page that honestly doesn't really happen on the writing stage. I mean, a 200 page graphic novel is probably two months of my life to write um, versus a year. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you damn well better respect your artist's time and their knowledge and, and, and everything. But that also, you know, that also does mean when you give notes about correcting things, you try to find the easiest possible correction for them. Mm. Is it just zooming in 10%? Is it zooming out a bit? Is it just changing where the foot is? Is it you fixing the letters? Like, you know, if someone, you know, don't don't ask for redraws unless like unless you basically are sending them booze as a thank you and the <laughs> and the read is I up, you know, and then don't up in future. Learn from that. I, I like couldn't agree with that more. I, I because as a writer, you forget, you'll be like, yeah. oh, I can do two or three, I'm doing, working on two or three projects at a time and all of that. And you forget mm -hmm. how labor intensive art is sometimes, you mm -hmm. know? And I just, I remember, you know, being like, oh, this person's driving in a car or, and they're being chased by people on a horse, <laughs> you know, on horses. And then you realize suddenly like, oh, when they, they're like, People, artists hate drawing horses and hate drawing cars <laughs> for the most part. <laughs> now you, you can put those two <laughs> nightmares together. <laughs> I like bet Tony was thrilled when you're like, Tony, I have an entire book set on a truck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I know, I know. Like, there, I, asked, I did ask him before. <laughs> Funniest thing about Tony with Noctera was he bought all these toy trucks and was like, "Catch oh, up! Just awesome. tell him to use." I mean, like we all love like I buy a Matchbox car for every car scene we have, but like Sketch Up is much much better. And if he's like <laughs> like advanced enough to use that, like it's oh, much no. easier to get the angles in there. I know, I've heard, yeah, but it, the it, you know it's the same thing. It's like and they're free, they're, like it's free, but also diecast models. D yeah, it's like whatever they want. But I, I mean, now I know the, the strategy. It's like whenever you want them, you're, you're, you need more time. You're like a horse wanders through. Let's <laughs> 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 fly upside down. That's it. <laughs> but no, we have, you, a rule, we have a rule that any any crowd scene has to have a dinosaur hidden in it. Yeah, <laughs> right. like I remember, uh, I was it, 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 yeah. I mean, there's so many horror stories of, of when I was starting out where I I didn't think of those things where I'm like. Yeah, you know what's cool? Like, a, you know, a 20 car car crash right yeah. here. And then you're like, next page. And then you realize like that. Kind of <laughs> Pedal <thing>. two. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Pedal two of 16. <laughs> oh. It's a, it, like you said, I think what you said, Alex, is, is, is priceless about, you know, understanding that, you know, artists for the most part are on one book, you know, and you can jump around. And as a writer, you can say things and then move on to another page. And, thinking about the labor it takes to, to do those things and, and their, their comfort zones also. And that comes into getting back to them quickly on notes. I mean, you, you're like, my schedule is a constant, like four alarm catastrophe, like witness me in this panel, like not even here at the right time. Um, but like, you have, a, you have an obligation to get back to your artist within 24 hours when they send you a page. And if it's to say, my life is falling apart right now, I got this, I'm thrilled to look at it. Let me look at it on the weekend when I've got brain space. That's one thing, but at least you acknowledge it. Um, 
and find something nice to say about it. Mm. I think to Scott's point, like you can tell, like I read the first issue, not, the first issue of Nocturne is fantastic. I mean, no surprise, but like the first issue of Nocturne is fantastic. But you can also tell that like Tony really enjoys drawing trucks mm. because the energy, you can see the energy totally. in the art. So like, it obviously wasn't a case of like, hey, Tony, here's a pit. Did I mention there's a bunch of cars and trucks in there? Like he clearly loves like drawing all, all, all that stuff. Well, I was like, they're either going to be riding trucks or horses in this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, he was, he's been great. And, but it is, it's a conversation, just like you're saying. And it's about approaching every artist beforehand and saying, you know, do you feel comfortable with this or yeah. uncomfortable in a good way? Like, wh what is it you want to do, you know? And not, I don't know. I mean, I, I understand. It, it, and, and again, like the process doesn't mean you have to reach out and, and adjust your writing style, but it's about understanding that whatever book you're on, it's a conversation with your art team, you know, and that you're respecting their time and their effort and their labor all of it and making mm -hmm. something together you're not going to get away with like writing a script setting it up and never looking at it again and right. never looking at the lettering and right. never, uh, i mean that i mean you can people people do all sorts of things in this world like, <laughs> you know yeah. Um, yeah. but yeah. one of the most fun questions one of the most fun things you can say to an artist is what do you want to draw and then you yeah make your story based on that. And I've done that a bunch of times. Yeah. Like, Twisted Romance was one of them where like all the main stories in that was me contacting like Trungles and like Carla Speed McNeil and, you know, Alejandra and saying like, what do you guys want to draw? Yeah. And they told me, Carla's like, I want to draw spaceships. And Trungles was like, I want to draw princesses. And I'm like, got it, you know. Go for it, do it. Comics writing is a weird thing, like and speaking on a panel of comic book writers, where it's like, you know, it's very much riding off the coattails of your artist. And so like, you know, you can, and, and I think we've all read them. There are there are mediocrely written comics that I love because they have fantastic art and I will buy them and I will buy them in multiple in multiple formats because it is such an artist medium. Like I think about it a lot. How about it, in a weird way, you know, so much of a job of a comics writer is uh, is to provide a platform is yes, to tell your story, but to also at the simultaneously provide a platform for your artist to succeed because in a weird mm -hmm. way, a comic book writer, the audience in a weird way, we're the last, we're the last person on the chain in the chain where they experience our talents. Because if you're going to a comic book shop, that cover is gonna get you to pick up that comic. You you flip it through, you flip it, you pick it up off the rack, you flip it through, it's like, ooh, this is this is great art, and you bring it home. And after an entire process is done, they actually go through the story and read it. And I've always said as a comic book writer, my job is to get you to, write, to read issue two. Like mm -hmm. the promotion and the, you know, the Stan Lee sidecar show that we do to promote our books, hopefully we'll get you to buy an issue one. But more often than not, it's someone picks a book off the shelf, appreciates the art that's on that, that's on that page because they don't have the time to process the story. And then they bring it home. And so it's, it's the artists, all the artists, from the cover artist to the letter all the way down, they're the people who get someone to bring that first issue home. And mm -hmm. then hopefully as writers, we can have them keep coming back. Yeah. Something somebody else was saying kind of triggered this thought for me and I'm, I'm curious how you come up with characters, if that is a thing that you bring to your artists or if it's just, you have somebody in mind that you know personally, like Rodney, I know that there's some characters in Philadelphia that are based off of like your family. And does that help you like kind of keep a structure of how you build these characters in your mind or, or does it just come to you naturally and they just like happen organically? Or like, as you keep writing and looking at the, the artist's work, like, does it just inform how you- A little bit of character? both. It's a little bit of both for me. I mean, I cer think certainly um, when you think about historical context, like when we were doing John Adams and um, there's a John Adams of the late 1700s and there's the John Adams of how we make him look uh, today. And, um, but that goes back into the collaborative aspect of what we were talking about a moment ago, where, you know, Jason has a lot of input with the physical look of how characters, mm. you know, act. I sort of give him, you know, all things visual, you know, he's the guy that's doing the visual storytelling and um, that's mostly on him. But like you said, a lot of the characters are based on real people and he does a photorealism thing. So I have a lot of people go to his home and he takes pictures mm. of them and oh, wow. he, he works off of that so uh it's kind of cool and makes it easy for me too yeah is this milan kundra quote um my characters are my friends and i and my unrealized possibilities and i've always kind of carried that with me um 
sometimes there are the unrealized possibilities of people I, I very dimly know or of a fictional, like a fictional character, um, you know, where I'm, I'm kind of saying, well, what if they made these choices, not that one? What if they were this sort of the person? What if they were more realistically like these people that I've encountered in my life? Um, you know, a lot of the characters in Drac Mofo were, you know, the brides, for example, were, were based on the idea of women who had, who had chosen to marry powerful, horrible men. And there are many of them. And kind of putting myself in their shoes and trying to understand why they did it and what happens, you know, like, what happens to Melania Trump, like, five years into that mar marriage where she's gotten the wealth that she thinks she wants, but probably not much else. I mean, you know, think of her what you will, like pro con, like I, I, I have no real opinion on her, but like that was a really interesting psychology to dig into. Um, yeah. yeah. A lot of it's a what if I was dot, dot, dot. And if the, if the person is very different from you, like Scott, your book is, is starring a woman and, 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 and a black man, you know, neither of which, to my knowledge, you are, um, or Tony is, um, or your editor is, um, you know, you, 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 you pr presumably based it on folks you know, and, you know, when things are very far from me, like, yeah, I keep mentioning Bad Karma, even though it's not an image book, um, you know, that's about two army veterans, and I've had it extensively beta with, with disabilities, and I've had it extensively beta read by friends who are in the army and have those disabilities, um, and also just friends who are able-bodied, neither still in the army or out, to say like, actually, this is how that would have happened. I mean, one of my best discussions was like, we, we needed one of the characters to have an AT4, which is a RPG launcher um, for reasons of mostly things exploding. Um, and <laughs> I was having conversations with serving army friends of mine about like, if you wanted to liberate an AT4 from your base, how would you go about it and not get caught? Like as an, have it, have it as an accident. And um, you know, we, we had this whole plot of like, like which, is, which is half of one page of like how this, this this missing RPG launcher like walked off the base and it's a very silly story but it's one that would absolutely check out if it really happened and mm. you know I think you know running things past people who are of you know if, if if they're not people like you who are of the demographic you're writing is really really important but also I beg of you pay them <laughs> like <laughs> If you're using people's lived experience to inform your own story that you're going to theoretically make a profit off of, theoretically mm. in comics, um, you know, pay them a consulting fee, even if it's a hundred bucks, yeah. even if it's 50 bucks, they're spending their time and, and possibly reading something triggering for them. I have friends who read, uh, Elsa Sjonason, who reads a lot of like deaf and um, deafblind stuff for um, sensitivity reading. I have black female friends who, who, who read, who sensitivity reads um, for, 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 for their lived experience. And they read some triggering, so you better pay them because it's their job to tell you that you're getting it wrong. <laughs> I, I couldn't agree more. You know, I think part of it for us is, again, building characters together. So, you know, when we were coming up with the characters for Actera, or the lead, especially for Val, you know, to, I brought, um, for me, I wanted a character who had, um, you know, growing up with anxiety and depression, somebody who had gone through an experience that made them feel as though, uh, something terrible like that was going to come back where they were going to understand that the real world is the one that you feel when you're feel worthless and that everything is hopeless. Um, and that was in a place where even though this was like a pause moment, uh, that would come, that would come back. And th that was reality. And when I brought that to Tony as the father of daughters and as someone of, um, you know, Mexican American heritage, he was like, I want to bring more to this character that would, make her someone that my daughters would look at and be excited about and that great let's let's put it together let's let's create something from the ground up um, with this character that feels mm. both of us at once and so that was the joy of that and getting to know each other better and that same thing like uh you know i couldn't agree more with what alex said about you know it, it's a very uh tricky thing it's a very uh, uh you know, strange position to be in too when you're writing characters from uh, backgrounds that aren't yours. But I think doing the opposite and, and making, you know, writing within a kind of insular, um, in an insular way, in my opinion, without reaching out to friends that you have, you know, again, like 
same thing. Like, you know, uh, Emery is a character that in the book that talked to my friends, both adoptees and friends that are African-American about, you know, it, it lived experience, but you can get it wrong, you know, and being able to say, I might get it wrong. I might screw this up and listening to people that say that you did, you know, in that way too. And you're going to have sooner or later. Like, you just have to accept it that like, you know, you shouldn't constrain your writing um, to only like mediocre safe areas because you're afraid of f***ing up. I mean, you see people canceled all online and all, you know, and, and you might think, oh, well, I shouldn't write, I shouldn't take big swings. I should just like bunt this. Like, no, don't do that. Um, take the biggest swing you can, do the most research you can to get it right. And when eventually you make a boo-boo, you just say, I'm sorry. And you learn from the experience, but you also don't expect the people offended to teach you because it's, the, it's not the job of the oppressed to teach the oppressor. Really kind of, you know, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say very quickly, it's the opposite for Jason and I, because a lot of Philadelphia is about cultural trauma and Jason about African-American cultural trauma and Jason isn't black. So he often comes to me and we have side conversations about things that have nothing to do with Philadelphia, but just about the nuance and specificity of what it means to be a black person in America and what I think about things just throughout history and how they connect to me on an emotional level. And I think it actually, mm -hmm. you can feel some of that in the art from time to time that's not baked into the script because he has a deeper understanding based upon those conversations. Yeah. That, that is a really, yeah. That's part of the joy of the art form, you know? And mm -hmm. I think that when you talk about people online and all of us together and this stuff that we're in it for the right reasons and we're willing to screw it up to, to try and, you know, make something that, that we believe in that will that will make us you know better as as creators to learn more from the response from it too all of it you know i'm meaning like there's nothing wrong with doing something if you do it in good faith and then like you said alex just you know it up and then having someone say to you you, you screwed that up you know and, and hearing that and listening and saying i've been in that position many times you know and i appreciate being in that position and hearing it and saying you know what, you're right, try and, I'm sorry, and you try and do better next time in a different way, but always understanding it as a conversation that the people that are saying that to you and, the, and you as a creator, all of us are in it to, to make things that we believe in, not to, you know, in bad faith for money or to exploit or whatever, but that we're, you know, everyone here, like writing comics for image, like, you know, you're, you're, you're here because you want to make things that you believe in and you're proud of for your children you know, all that stuff, you know, Noctera for me is a book that I'm writing for my kids, you know, in that way, my 14 year old who it's like, you know, he's crying a couple of nights ago, feels like he, he, what's the point of everything, that kind of stuff. And the book is literally about a darkness that separates us and changes us into things that are unrecognizable to each other. And, you know, it's translated into the lexicon of like comic book lunacy and, and that stuff, but you're still writing something that you believe is resonant for, for whatever, reason you're doing it for me that book is that it's designed for my you know for my for that that kind not not yeah it's adults too but it's that it's speaking to him saying it's going to be okay in some way and so if you screw something up like a character is is wrong all of it like totally you you want to hear you it, and you it. Be better because you believe in the project mm -hmm. you're not you're not, you know you're not there to do something every one of these books and i appreciate very much alex that you you thought to be like can um Marla send us the copies of, of everyone's book. And there were a couple of things I hadn't read um, too, but reading up on everyone's stuff, what you get the sense of from day one, from page one is passion. You know, people don't make create your own books, you know, or none of us, I think on this panel, make create your own books to just be like, here it is, make it a film that, you know, whatever. <sighs> like you can, you can read The Good Asian or Dracula Mother or Philadelphia or Die, Once in Future, all of it, and see from the beginning, they're passion projects, that's it. And, and you don't come to that in bad faith. And I think that's the, that's the takeaway is that we want to learn from each other and be better. And we should be taken to task when we don't do something right. And that's a good thing. You know, it's a good thing if you're in the conversation for the right reasons. And no, none of these books feel in the conversation for a bad, bad reason. I don't think you could find an image book that's like, you know, yeah. many for that reason. I think everybody yeah. here has a, has a curiosity about human beings. And that's some of the great, you know, People create for a lot of reasons, and the the, the the works that I tend to to feel most connected with, you can tell that the creators are curious about human beings and how they work and what their reactions would be, and that's all you know. That's just human beings as as a group. 
um, when put in different situations and they want to learn more about everyone. And that's, that's yes. one of the places that, that Marla, as you were saying, the characters come from. Just yes. desire to, to say, oh, well, like, why is this person like this? Like, what if they did that, you know? Yeah, yeah. and I think all these characters, like us, like everything else, they're all, they're all ongoing conversations too. Like I, you know, writing The Good Asian specifically, there, there's a, a, a writer by the name of Jane, Jay Caspi and Kang who said, uh, every stand you take for authenticity triggers its own questions about what constitutes authenticity. And I think about that a lot when I'm writing The, the Good Asian because, you know, uh, you know, I identify as Thai American. This book reaches into my Chinese American, uh, my, my, my ethnically Chinese roots. And it's a book about the detective stories that in 1936 about, you know, the first generation of immigrants, of Americans who came of age under an immigration ban, and that's the Chinese. It took a lot of research to there's not a lot of books written about that. And so there's no books written about, there's exactly no books written about that as a matter of fact. So like writing that, I had to kind of Tetris many different reference texts to sort of feel like what the people were that are like, you know, the, the, the people I really wanted to talk to, they're, they're sadly not, not a lot of them are speaking or they're not, or they speak pure Chinese that, which I can't, which I can't speak. But I do have a lot of, you know, it would be easy to think a book like that, me being Asian, I, feel I can write that book. But the truth of the matter is I'm terrified I'm the wrong, I'm the wrong person to, to write that book. I'm terrified that all my hangups of being Asian gives me blind spots about all, you know, about all the things that, that I should be sensitive to. And, and a lot, honestly, that's a lot of where the title of the book comes from. It's a lot of what I imbue a lot of that into my protagonist. The good Asian comes from the fact of, you know, it, it riffs off of the model minority uh, myth that comes off from Asians in general, but it also comes from years of me joking and friends joking like, oh, I'm a good Asian, I'm a bad Asian. And what does that mm -hmm. mean? What does it mean to be a good person of your ethnicity? What does it mean to be sort of a good ally? And those are sort of works in progress and conversations in progress for, for all of us. And, you know, for me, it's one of the reasons why I wanted to do a, de a, de a detective story and a, those themes that I want to talk about, it makes sense it should come from a person who's professionally looking for answers. It, a, a noir environment where it feels like you're alone and it feels like you're going, you're, you're searching through the dark feels right when you're asking these questions. But there, you know, I think, part of the thing, and I think part of the themes that we're talking about here is that I hope, you know, hopefully all these stories that we tell, whether they're big and bombastic or they're small and intimate, they're hopefully engines for empathy. They're, ho they're hopefully starting conversations, not ending conversations. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and that's certainly, you know, that's certainly where my book came from. And again, to Scott's point, I think you can see that from all of our work that they come from, you know, they come from people wanting to explore people, different aspects of life and different people. And for me, Eve, to what Porsak just said, um, you know, I come from a slave port, uh, Annapolis, Maryland, mm. and um, a lot of the math of that period of time of slavery still in its own way exists uh, in my hometown. And there's mm. more public housing per capita in that town than many cities in America. I think it's supposed to be the first. And a lot of those people don't have a voice. And much of what I wanted to put under Philadelphia was what if those people had a voice and they had power and they had perspective and that's what vampirism gave them and so to what Pornsack was saying you know part of the mission in Philadelphia was to sort of vent you know the frustration yeah. of being able to say something that I'd felt for the better part of my life but really didn't have a vehicle to get it out. Yeah, I've been, a, I've always been a big believer that, you know, people come to fiction for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons why people come to fiction is to look for truth where facts don't exist. Mm -hmm. And I feel that way about the good Asian. There aren't facts about the people I'm right. writing about. They're very yeah. scant few facts. So what I have to do is transpose a bunch of facts. And hopefully if I'm truthful enough to all those facts, there's something true in there uh, because I can't talk to the people that, that it actually happened to. Well, writing is taking a bunch of lies and making a truth out of it. Always has been. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, I have one last question for you that uh, I'm just curious about. I'd like to know from each of you, kind of just real quickly, what's one piece of advice that you wish you got when you were starting out comic writing specifically, like your professional comic writing career? What's something you would tell a new comic writer? So many I would tell them the same thing that I told Kieran like a billion years ago. Which, which is, one this is, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm interested. 
<laughs> so there's one thing Alex did say to me, I quote a lot, so I'll see if it's the same one. I think it is the same one. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. When I knew Kieran, he was considering putting two books out, um, one of which was a like a supernatural like detective thing, and the other was phonogram. And mm -hmm. I knew Kieran quite well, we both lived in London at the time, and I was like, well, put out phonogram because you're setting out your stall and I want you should put out the most you book you possibly can. Anyone could write that supernatural mystery. I mean, it was, it was a good book, like, don't get me wrong, but it wasn't like, it wasn't identifiably like, hi, my name is Kieran. This is what I do. This is like, hi, my name is Kieran. Here's a book that's like very several other books out there. Um, as a new creator, you should trust your own voice and put out the most you book that you possibly can, even though, even if you're really worried that no one else is gonna to wanna to read it. Cause let me tell you one thing. If, if you write a book for other people, for like the audience, the market, because the market likes this and they don't like it, you're stuck. You've made a book that you don't really like and they don't like it either. So you put all this effort into this thing and nobody really wants it. You might like, like if you make a book that you really love and feel passionate about, at least one person will like it. That's you. It's a win. And then you'd be surprised because there are a lot of people out there who want a different book or who would feel seen in your book. So you should trust in yourself and, you know, like Rodney, like with Philadelphia, he's like, I'm going to rant about the black experience and vampires for coming on to 15 issues now. And it's a fantastic book, you know, like Rodney, did you ever have a point there where you're like, I don't know if like, this is just me in my head doing a thing or like. From day one, I still do. <laughs> Wait, are, are there people who don't have that? I still I, do, uh, at this moment. What I does mean. that feel like? Yeah. <laughs> it never goes away. I remember. <laughs> meeting Neil Gaiman for the first time and being so excited and having, yeah, you could see I was like super nervous about um, getting into comics and he was like, oh, don't worry. He's like, right now you just think you're not good enough. Pretty soon you'll think you used to be better. And that's all. <laughs> <laughs> yep, <laughs> big mood. It's true. And I think what, what you said, Alex, and what you were saying to Rodney, it's like, you know, uh, you I, I would echo what Alex said entirely. I had a teacher when I was like, just a, my son's age, who was like, you got to write the story that you would like to find on the shelves that day more than any other. It doesn't have to be yes. the smartest, it doesn't have to be, it could be any genre, it can be anything, you know, but understand that, uh, it, you know, put out the thing that you would love the most and that's it, you know. Um, but I think because she said that too, I, I would say um, was another piece of advice, just don't th try and also think of it as as something that um you need to do every day to some extent you know or as much as you can like think of it as your secret real job and whatever else mm -hmm. you're doing if you really want to do it and try and write when you're most uninspired also you know for me at least like it, the big lesson was like to do it before i was going to teach you know or do it uh before i was interning wherever whatever it was like to to do it when you don't feel like it and to make it the mm. thing that you get in the habit of feeling like you're going to finish things and get them out in the world and demystify it for yourself a little bit because i think for me writer's block was always like just the fear of writing something really shitty where i couldn't i i knew that that day i was going to be really miserable with myself and my output and at least for my process and i'm sure it's different for everybody but um getting over that and understanding that it was okay to write something awful that day, as long as I felt good about having written something, that really helped me. Just being like, today I'm going to write. And it doesn't mean you have to write five pages or whatever, just I'm gonna sit there and I can stare at a screen and I'm not gonna get up. I'm just gonna, even if I just write or don't, but I sit there and put my time in, it makes me feel better about calling myself to myself, a writer, and, mm. and it helped me get over the fear of, you know, putting myself out there. Yeah. And start small, like finishing things is a habit. So don't start on your giant 60 issue, like sci-fi saga spectacular. Um, I remember when like Vertigo was a thing and like every writer was pitching their like 60 issue, like Lucifer Magnum Opus. And I was like, child, please don't do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> like publishing a comic book every month is way harder than you think it is. Mm -hmm. um, so like make a small book first and make it as best you can, but it's okay if it's only eight pages, but finish it and yeah. get it made because that will teach you more than endlessly pitching your 24 issue maxi series when you haven't completed many like any actual comics um, and it'll make you feel better like once you finish the thing you're like yes okay and then you can put it away and then you can start on the next thing and you're like I finished the thing and maybe find an artist to do that you know that short piece because it's not too much of a, a, a brain on their time. 
Kieran was that the the piece of advice that you were thinking it was actually like I think the way it is do you want this to be your first book is the one line Alex used and I quote and that's a good way of putting it like as you said it's what is most unique about what is a unique thing you can you only do. have one first book do you want this to be it that was it uh Jesse broad things to hit very quickly so that was loud <laughs> uh, actually to, generally I can I've got a load of like one line sort of bits of advice. Sort of speaking to one thing that we're talking about, the, the character stuff, like, um, and it was mentioned that people are kind of intimidated of trying stuff. And, you know, Alex was talking about apologizing and all this. And one thing I occasionally say to writers is, um, like, your concern is a good sign. Mm -hmm. Like, it's the, pe the people who don't, who don't show enough concern, they don't do due diligence, they don't ask the people, they're the people who tend to, they fall down an enormous hole and fuck up really hard, you know? So, mm -hmm. you know, your concern is not a problem, it's actually a good thing, use that. And the other thing I would, especially to really beginning writers, if you're just starting into comics and you're pitching your 60 issue series, try doing a comic. Like in any way you can, do a photo comic, do like doodles. And try to, in other words, don't just think about writing action comics and having a cool artist. Like, can you execute something in your limited style, however you did it? And that'll mm -hmm. teach you about comics and their lessons that transfer. Like the idea that writing is a discipline separate to like art in a complete way. If you're coming up, especially for the indie way, that's a really useful skill to just know what the job, sorry, to know what the job is. In the same yeah. way, Alex being a letterer now also knows so much about that in a hands-on way. Mm. That's super I, yeah. people, like I, we're scared all the time writing. Like, you know, it's good when you're scared. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm petrified. Don't ever move beyond that. <laughs> and you kind of start chasing it. Like, yeah. like, wow, I'm on, like, I'm, I'm staring into the abyss. I could really this up. Like, yeah, that's the good, that's the good stuff. And I know also, like as an image panel, this this might not be the most, but typical, like the most relevant thing. But going off of what Pornsack was saying too, like I know there are a lot of people that think about writing superheroes and that stuff, and they have this misconception. I think sometimes that, you know, that's a world that you know, like Alex said earlier, like you do it for the market or you do it whatever. Don't worry about that world at all. Like the only way to ever get into that world or enjoy that world or not get ground up and spit out and you know by that world is to do what everybody here is saying make your own work have a place where you go where you understand who you are and the only thing you have to offer superheroes that are 80 years old 50 years old is you when you go in there and your passions and your anxieties and your fears and your hopes and all of that stuff and if you don't bring that to them with all of their kind of architecture and design before you get in there there's no point you know there, there's nothing to do with that if you just do something that's like i have a cool joke or whatever it's doesn't matter who cares it doesn't mm. matter so this is the world like this what we're talking about to me it's this is and and i wish we could do this panel another hour i love this has been <laughs> yeah i miss everybody i miss <laughs> yeah Porn tech, you were gonna say yeah. something too matters. yeah i'm sorry i didn't mean to oh, no 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 i i mean first of all i i think everyone has covered everything i sort of could possibly sort of say um so the only thing i which is kind of sort of like the the, the asterisks in the bit that i would add but I think it sort of tie, ties in with all that sort of stuff is, and listen, this is a lot of like uh, uh, a note to myself as, as well, is that I think as writers, we have a tendency to go inwards and stay locked up. Well, now, now we have no choice, but locked up in our homes and and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, one of the, it's one of the uh, things that makes comics comics is that like, especially if you're starting out, like, don't just be a friend to your artist, be a friend to artists, because that is, it's a fascinating thing that you can't make a comic by yourself. Right. So like you have to, you know, and, and people come in through different routes and some people come in and a big company will come in and give you an artist, but other people that's like, you've actually got to go out and sort of find your artists. And I think to sort of everyone's point, that's actually where sort of leading with your passion helps because it is so much easier to find an artist once you've led with your passion. And, and beyond that, it, and it's one of those that magics of comics is when you lead with your passion, you'll be amazed how you'll find collaborators who you feel like you've known for the longest amount of time where you have all the same interests, even though statistically that should be impossible that, you know, two people of, of who like the same things will come, will be at the same place at the same time and sort of see, but that's all because you sort of led with your passion. So it all kind of feeds into one another. Um, yeah, it all kind of feeds into one another. And kindness costs nothing. I was about to say, yeah. yeah, I mean, Alex, the thing I was thinking there, I think you'll agree with me here. I'm sorry, I found myself thinking about stuff we've done in the past, but we should explicitly say, be nice to your artists or, and look after them. Because I hear, yeah. like, you do hear horror stories of, art, of writers treating artists like So I'm, mm. I'm, the, I'm the person who's swearing. I'm so shocked. I'm so <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but like, that kind of like, you look but after your artists. Be good, you know? Like, you know, that's yeah. kind of... Like, it gets around real fast if you're a jerk, okay? Like, real yeah. fast. Exactly, that's the thing totally. is, like, and... even if you're being cynical, it's better to be good. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Like, I don't care why you're nice. Just be nice. Like, yeah. Um, and also we're not in competition with each other. I mean, like, you know, I might have a book on the stands at the same time as Scott. We're not competing ever. Like, so you're not, you're never like, even if we were both up for the same job, I mean, he get it, but, um, like we're not competing. Right. So there's no reason to treat other writers or other people in the comics industry like competitors. And especially with you at an early stage, it's really important for young writers and young artists to hang out once we all can hang out again. I mean, like Discord exists for a reason. Um, to hang out with people who are at your own level um, and experience level because you, 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 you start trading contacts, you start introducing each other, you start putting indie books together. Um, you become a tribe, the tribe becomes a movement, the movement becomes the next generation. So you continually rise up with the same people who came in around the same time as you. Do you have to hang out with all of them? No, because some of them are going to be jerks. But right. we just don't talk about those people. You know, like yeah. you, you hang out with the people you vibe with um, and don't always be looking to, 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 to be hanging out with a couple of generations above you. I mean, we love you, but you, know, you should be forming connections with, with the folks that, that are around the same level as you. Right. And also, it's just a good life. Like, uh, honestly, it's one of those few times where good business decisions lead to just a good lifestyle. So just mm. do it. Rodney, did you have anything? Very quickly, because ev what everybody said was great. Um, write from your heart. Anytime I've written from my head or from any other intention due to insecurity or fear or feeling as though my voice wasn't worthy, I've failed. And anytime mm. that I've written from my heart, I feel connected to the work regardless of where it lands or how well it does. So that's it. That's great advice. <laughs> there is no word. I couldn't agree with that more. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, yeah. Kind of, it's that kind of, yeah. yeah. That <laughs> kind of sums it all up. Yeah. yeah. We have our closing statement. Yes. Well, let's end it there. <laughs> yeah. Shut up. Anchor. Rodney I'm coming anchor. in like the sniper. I'm like, the anchor. Oh, I've, been, uh, I've always been the anchor. <laughs> you know, tug of war, <laughs> anything. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us for this panel, taking like a little bit extra time, but I, I so appreciate it. That was really fascinating to hear. And I know that our audience is really going to appreciate that. Um, and thank you to everybody who's watching for WonderCon. Uh, we're sad we can't be here in person, but at least we can do this. This is still great. And um, one of the ways that you can help every one of these writers here is go order books at your local comic book shop. Um, they need our help more than ever for sure. And you can get everybody's book there. Noctera, Dracula Mofo, Die, Philadelphia, and The Good Asian will be coming out in May and also Porn Sex Other Book, uh, Infidel as well. Um, Thank you so much for joining us. We so appreciate it. Thanks to everybody here. Thank you, Marla. Good one. Thank All you, right. Marla. Thank you. Yes, Marla. thank you, Marla. Appreciate it.